The summer after my freshman year at Penn, I, as a nursing major with minors in Global Health, Religious Studies, and Human Rights, worked as a nursing assistant at Heart for Africa's Children's Home in the Kingdom of Eswatini. At that time, in 2017, they had 160 children. Now, they have over 260 kids. During my first week working there, they had a chickenpox scare. One child presented with a chickenpox rash. Since the kids live and play in close quarters with each other, the staff was afraid that there would be an uncontrollable chickenpox outbreak among the children. There were only two nurses and one doctor who take care of these children, so a chickenpox outbreak would be, as you can guess, a disaster. So we needed to vaccinate all the kids against chickenpox, but to avoid wasting resources, we needed to know who has had a chickenpox vaccine or the chickenpox disease itself. I was tasked with finding this information by going through the paper health charts. It took me more than two hours to go through each of the 160 charts to find this information. And in the end, I found that there was one child who had the vaccine and another child who had the disease. If we had an electronic health record system, or EHR, I could have found that information in quite literally one minute. So I got a group of engineering students at Penn together and we made the EHR. Last summer in July 2019, with support from grants, we traveled to Eswatini and successfully installed the system in the middle of a forest fire too. During the two year process of designing and making the EHR from scratch, I found that there was a gap in the literature about EHRs implemented in limited resource settings. The current literature focuses on EHRs in the global north. These EHRs are based on billing systems, so they work to benefit hospital systems rather than help the clinicians and patients. This does not fit the needs of limited resource healthcare settings, primarily in the global south, where there may be unstable electricity, no internet, or a shortage of trained staff. So I wanted to do research on the creation, implementation, and effectiveness of these EHRs in limited resource settings. What needs to happen during the creation process to ensure a quality EHR? What's necessary for a successful EHR implementation in a limited resource setting? And finally, how effective actually are EHRs in limited resource settings? So I conducted two kinds of evaluations. The first kind is evaluating the EHR while constructing it so that we can improve the system while it's still in development. The second kind is evaluating the EHR's implementation and effectiveness. To evaluate the EHR during the creation process, we tested the time it took for people to complete certain tasks, like graphing a height measurement. We also collected user feedback from the participants. The results showed that the EHR needed to be more intuitive to use, so we needed to polish the EHR's design. So we used the feedback to create a more intuitive EHR, guided by how the nurses at Heart for Africa thought the system should function. I held weekly video calls with the nurses to make sure that the EHR was what they wanted. To evaluate the EHR's implementation process, and if the EHR is actually useful, I sent out surveys to the nurses before and after we implemented it. The post-surveys were done at one and six months after implementation. When comparing the results, I found three main lessons. First, the end users of the EHR need to be involved in the creation process. The nurses themselves thought that it was crucial to have been involved in this process so that the EHR would actually be useful for them. For us, this was accomplished through the weekly video calls. This gave us a chance to exchange feedback and ideas weekly to make sure that the EHR was tailored to their specific setting and workflow. Also, through these calls, the nurses had more time to familiarize themselves with the EHR. In the end, this made the end product easy to learn and use, as shown by the results from the perceived ease of use scale. So as a result, they could transition their work onto the electronic system more quickly after it was implemented. Second, training and tech support are really important. The pre-implementation surveys and responses to the healthcare provider involvement scale and adequate training scale showed that the nurses and doctor were concerned about having enough training to effectively transition to the EHR. They were also worried about having to troubleshoot support if problems come up when using the system, since we wouldn't be physically there to help. Because of this feedback, we spent lots of time training them in person. We also showed them how we were able to provide tech support for the EHR remotely. As a result, the six months post-implementation survey showed that the nurses really appreciated the support. A nurse wrote, 
The support we have been getting to help make some updates to the EHR and to make it even more effective is helpful. I'd love to have a week or month with the team again to be able to really refine it, but the help we have been getting is great. Third, the EHR is a huge improvement to paper charting, even in a limited resource setting like this children's home in Eswatini. The perceived usefulness scale showed that the nurses strongly agreed to each statement about the EHR's usefulness. Also, the nurses were able to do tasks like graphing growth measurements much faster than before, which gave them more time to actually take care of the patient. The nurses also reported many benefits that the EHR offered, including improving quality and coordination of care. The EHR had features that aren't in the paper charts, such as automatically generating to-do lists, having a red high or low alert, which is helpful, for example, to alert the nurse when a child has a fever, and showing what drugs are low in stock or will expire soon. Even at one month post-implementation, the nurses reported that the EHR was very useful. One nurse wrote that, I am put more information in the EHR than I would have if I had to go back and write it all down in the paper file. And it's timely to have it now and not when there's 300 kids. It's been really exciting and good. The other nurse wrote, it's already making a huge difference. Y'all are crazy innovative. At six months post implementation, a nurse wrote that the EHR has affected care greatly in a positive way at Heart for Africa. Now with 261 children to care for, it is even more vital to have the system in place. I cannot imagine returning to paper charting. All in all, my research has showed that successfully constructing and implementing an EHR in a limited resource setting is possible and has great benefits. Weekly video calls with the end users, evaluations during the creation process, adequate training, and reliable remote tech support are needed. At Heart for Africa, the EHR has saved the nurses much time and increased their capacity to care for more children more efficiently, effectively, and safely. This project has broad applications for other limited resource settings that need an EHR. This project showed what needs to go into each phase of EHR construction, implementation, transition, and training. All this needs to be done together with the end users of the EHR so that the final product will be useful for them. As mentioned before, many EHRs in the global north are based upon billing systems, making them frustrating for clinicians to use. A different system needs to be in place one that prioritizes healthcare over finances. And as the world changes with advancing technologies, tools like EHRs have the potential to greatly benefit healthcare. In the end, this will help patients, nurses, and physicians, maximizing the healing power of healthcare.